Welcome to the Pangburn Universe, or my corner of it. I'm Masha Anderson, uh, your friendly neighborhood female supremacist. Uh, today we have a wonderful uh, guest on our show. Her name is Ayla. Uh, she's a former sex worker, cam girl, and sex researcher. And we'll be talking about all sorts of uh, interesting topics. Um, so I would like uh, to, to welcome her onto the stage. <laughs> <laughs> just absolute chaos sorry about that <laughs> <Ew>. <laughs> we have like a new Hello. platform and everything and I'm trying to set up a studio which I'm sure you can sympathize with <laughs> yeah I'm still I'm so behind on setting up a studio of, of my own I'm actually traveling right now so this is a friend's setup but yeah, that's legit. I was I tried like many different things and uh, just was like broadcasting for a while from a closet with like a sheet tacked up to the wall behind me. <laughs> and now I'm just in my like home gym. So whatever, I guess we'll see <laughs> how that works out. So um, I thought I thought usually I introduce my guests, but I would love for you to introduce yourself because I think the way you speak about yourself is uh, is really an important like context for our conversation. So would you mind introducing yourself? Oh man. Okay. I've done this so many times and every time it, I don't, <laughs> I should probably like memorize the script, but no, I don't know. I do. I've been doing various kinds of sex work for like 10 years. And then I was like, Oh, what happens if you ask corny men a bunch of questions? And then turns out you get data. And then if you get data, you're like, Oh no, how do I analyze the data? And then you're like, I guess I have to learn statistics. And then you write about it and you post it online. People yell at you and then you're like, fuck, is statistics wrong? And then you have to go learn the answers. And then you iterate a couple times. And then now you are a fetish researcher. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. That's interesting. Cause I've, I've watched a bunch of interviews uh, like, I, I think for me, one of the more fraught ones was like you on Benjamin Boyce talking to Megan Murphy. Oh, that was terrible. <laughs> yeah, that, was, that was a whole thing. I thought that was such a mismatch conversationally. And like, um, at the time, I, I really sympathized with her, you know, trying to figure out in what way you considered yourself a researcher. And I'm not sure that I'm not sure that that turned out to be super relevant because I don't I don't think that you're, you're saying that you're speaking about all men when you're talking about these sexual practices and interests. Well, no, I mean, generally, I, I don't think any, it'd be so weird to have anything applied to all men at all. <laughs> That's such a weird concept. Or all there's women, women, right? You can have yeah. correlations or trends, but like there's always going to be like somebody who's weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, to to a certain extent, also, I think that when when I'm when I speak to women about you, there's also this guardedness about like, well, like she's she's saying some things that that could be very detrimental for like the way that women are perceived in society. And and I just want to clarify, you're not you're also not talking about all women, right? No, definitely not. I don't think I've ever. Oh, I've never. That's like such like beyond my co concept of how this works. Uh, but but maybe this is like sort of like an intuition that people have that I'm not like quite processing. Like if somebody's like, oh, you know, uh, women are m compared to men are more likely to blank. Like the thing that they hear is like, oh, now we need to interpret all women as more likely to blank, which is not true. It's not how this works. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And uh, like these kind of, uh, I don't know, like fairly marginal conversations do however have the power to to be like extrapolated onto like ge the general population right so i think that there's a fear that the the kind of things that you're talking about are are going to like sort of pull the larger culture in a certain direction if that makes sense mm -hmm. yeah and there's a lot of people that are like invested in various camps in that right yeah i think i adhere to like something like that which can be killed by the truth should be like and I, I'm just kind of really earnest and a little naive about it. Like, if you just earnestly pursue what is true, regardless of, like, the implications, then eventually it's going to be okay in the end. Okay, so now we're involving some philosophical concepts. Like, so do you think that there is such a thing as the truth? I mean, depends on what you mean by the truth. <laughs> <laughs> yes and no, depending on your definition. Right, like the quote that you just gave me, what, uh, like, in what way do you interact That's with fair. the truth inside of that? Uh, I think there's something like uh, this. There's things that uh, make you surprised. 
like the sensation of surprise that you have like maybe you think there's like an apple behind the door and then you open the door and you see a banana um and then you're like ah i was wrong um and there's something like like if you kind of uh, perform tests about it if it's like impacts you in relevant ways uh, this is what i would consider the truth in this sense I don't know if that is clear. Impact you. Okay. So like being surprised. So something that challenges like the status quo or the, the sort of like capable of surprising you, you know, I, I, I believe in like, there's like this other form of truth, which is like subject, like whatever you experience is your truth. Right. Uh, and we should probably be using different words for them entirely. <laughs> uh, and that's, I also think that's like, in a, like a kind of spiritual and psycho, like a psychedelic sense. This is true. Um, but there's definitely something that happens when like, you're like, uh, I believe really hard that you can, if you don't eat food, you can become a breatharian and then live on air and then <laughs> die. And there's something about like in the dying, like that is the truth, right? Like, oh, the, the so you've, yeah, you've revealed the truth of that, uh, like ideology or like whatever is right. Is that, is the that what you mean? The consequences, yeah. Right. The consequences. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing can be known by its effect. Mm. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will definitely buy that. That's definitely something that I'm willing to like, you know hold for the purposes of this conversation as being truth. Uh, so I want to know, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of more interested in you as a person and like how you came to be in the position that you're in right now and, and having the conversations that you're having. Uh, I, I find it fascinating. Like I'm an external observer of like kind of Western culture. I, I didn't grow up here and I, I it, sort of like that, you know, stranger in a strange land kind of thing. I, I mm. observe from the outside and I think that gives me a unique perspective. So uh, I always wonder what causes some conversations and some people and some kind of like um, uh, preoccupations to sort of like bubble to the surface at a particular time. Do you have do you have any insight about that for yourself? Wait, sorry. Uh, uh, are you saying what causes like preoccupations to bubble to the surface? Well, yes, in general. And why do you think that you're being f sort of foregrounded on so many like podcasts and so many people are having conversations about the things that you're talking about right now? Oh, um, my guess is like I occupy a really unique space where there's not a lot of competition, which is something like like sex person and then thinking person. Um, and then people are a little bit scandalized by this. Also, like the kinds of things that I'm thinking about are also sort of unique. I, I, I think I have like some sort of trend where it's like instead of competing in the uh, arena that's like well-worn, like find a new arena, like invent the new game. Um, I think I trend <laughs> towards this. Like what is the new game of research? We don't know anything about sex. Um, so it's just like a combination of a lot of these things. But there's a, there's a bigger reason in which I'm like, I don't know why everybody's paying attention to me. Like sometimes like something happens on a podcast. I'm like, <laughs> like really? <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> why is there not somebody else you're asking? It's, it's a little surreal. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that makes sense. There are some of, some of the podcasts I've watched you on. I also wonder why people are asking you some of these questions because clearly it's not, it's not in the flow of the conversation. I mean, sometimes potentially it's like to catch you out about some things or to, to like force you into a corner. So you do make some declarative like statement that can be then framed as a, a mistake or like an ideological position that has to be defended that I think for the most part you seem unwilling to do. Right. I, I don't, I would have to think of specific examples, but my guess is if you're just really consistent, then you're safe. Right. Well, one example is that uh, you have a particular take on trauma, if you want to talk oh, about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like trauma is fake. I don't literally believe trauma, trauma is fake. Is fake. <laughs> I don't actually <laughs> believe that. <laughs> no, I mean, let's talk about it. I'm like, I am down to have the conversation as broadly as possible. And like, there are no... Like, no guardrails, no bumpers. Like, let's just talk about it. Like, wrong answers only. I don't care. You know, like, let's let's explore. Yeah, you know, I think there's, like, some kind of fun thing. Like, if you try and, you know, frameworks as hats, where you sort of take on, like, what happens if we make this assumption and let's just, like, kind of embody for it for a while and argue from it. And I think this is kind of how I explore, like, slightly more extreme thoughts. It doesn't mean that I'm, like, actually endorsing it. Like, I'm not sure I want to keep this hat for a long time. I just, like, want to see what happens if we're arguing from it. And I kind of am having this right now with the whole trauma thing. I'm like, okay, what What if we just, like, assume that everything we've thought about trauma is, like, complete bullshit? Like, what happens? Um, so, yeah. But, like, I mean, interesting. Like, what's your approach to it? Like, wh how did you arrive to that, um, like, what made you want to play with that? Have you applied it to your own life? You know, all of those questions. Uh, I mean, like one, I, it, when this personal, like I had a really abusive childhood and then I had to forgive my dad. And I mean, forgive is like kind of a bad word for that, but like, 
get over it in some way. And by getting over it, like the only way to do that was sort of by like reframing what uh, the narrative about what had happened to me. Um, so there's like a personal thing there, but there's also like a lot of it comes from reading about history. I'm like really interested in really foreign cultures. Like what are cultures that are completely different? Uh, like really ancient ones. And the things that they took as normal then are like, would be considered horrifically traumatizing for now. Uh, I'm like right now I'm like really big into reading about like Native American versus like this an original clash. Um, and so like people kind of discovering each other's cultures. And there's like a lot of accounts in like the Native American uh, habits where we would consider this to be really traumatizing. Like the women are all cheering as they're like torturing, you know, captive uh, settler, right? <laughs> like, you know, like graphic descriptions of like tearing the flesh off the bones as the person is wailing. And everybody's like, woo. And there's just like zero implication in any of this that anybody – anybody of that culture is like is finding this to be traumatizing or there's like a tribe in Africa where they have all the the young boys as a coming of age like suck the semen out of the adult men um so there's like like dude history is chock full of shit that like we would consider to be inherently traumatizing but there doesn't I, I don't know even you could argue that like maybe they were traumatized by it but it was repressed and maybe to some extent this is true but I would be shocked if it were 100 percent true you know I think an anthropologist would say that those rituals have a specific uh, purpose, right? Like a, mm -hmm. those are kind of uh, ways of acculturating a young person to to that particular like context. And yes, many of them are meant to to sort of like um, uh, n not get rid of, but like to to remove the focus on the in from the individual onto the collective in some way, like to to even like break down a sense of self that an individual might have in favor of like the collective consciousness of the, of the tribe or community or whatever. Um, so, so they are, they are traumatizing on purpose, right? So that we like the, 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 the self-consciousness, whatever flees from the suffering, from the trauma, from the pain into the, the warm embrace of, of like a communal identity. There's, there's definitely, uh, there's something like 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 gauntlets or coming of age rituals is like definitely a breaking down. You can see this with cults, but I think the thing you said about meaning feels like kind of important. Like the thing where I like got over you know my childhood abuse or whatever. Like the way I did that was by restructuring like the meaning because before it was like oh this bad thing happened to me for no reason, and then like coming to terms with it was like finding the meaning in it. Like no this bad thing happened to me for these reasons, and I ultimately actually like value the lessons that it taught me. And so I think like this is probably getting at the heart of it the thing that you said but like if you can find meaning in the thing that happened then it's no longer traumatic which completely is like not in line with a lot of the ways people talk about trauma people talk about trauma as like belonging to like the event or the action itself not in talking about the meaning making about it yeah i mean that that presupposes a lot of of other things though right like that presupposes that the person the traumatized person has survived to make any kind of meaning from it mm -hmm. uh that they've survived with enough of their cognition and and consciousness and self intact to to you know participate in meaning make, meaning making systems or or um you know rituals or or like consciousness expanding practices right like so yes and no kind of you know what i mean yeah, th there's definitely a thing where it's like, oh, you got chased by a bear and then tortured and then you escaped. And like now whenever you see bears, you have like a really significant reaction. And that's probably independent of meaning making. Like you could do however many stories you want about like how the bear like was actually, you know, a god or something. Sure, but sure, your body sure. has a physiological. So I think there is that thing. I don't. Uh oh, did I just disappear? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you again. You're just kind of lagged for a moment. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, so <laughs> nothing I, I, I'm a little bit confused about how these two types of trauma like, interact with each other, but I do agree it's not all the same thing. Right, right. So I think what... Um... To go back to sort of my question about your your experience with it. So when when people are kind of describing their philosophy or even like sort of these uh, these like propositional like things that they're like you, you described hats you're putting on or like ideas you're trying out. Um, one of the one of the first things I like to ask is like, have you tried it? Like, have you has self experimented with it? Like, have you embodied it? Right. So clearly you have. Right. Because you talked about recontextualizing your own like trauma history and so forth. And uh, and so to like flowing from that is why do you why do you think that speaking about it in sort of the public sphere has been so explosive? Has it? I don't. I feel like normally people get mad at me for things like not showering and less <laughs> common thing. 
I mean, I like as a female supremacist, it's like feminism adjacent, right? So feminists are talking about your reframing of trauma. Uh, and I'll tell you specifically, it's because the narrative sounds very close to sort of like the like early 80s, like NAMBLA talking points. And I don't know if you know what NAMBLA is. It's the North American Man Boy Love Association, right? So they put mm -hmm. out, they like funded studies and put out many papers to say that children aren't traumatized by by uh, being sexually abused, they're traumatized by society's reaction to that sexual abuse. So that's why it's being discussed in those circles in that context. I think it's generally correct. Like, uh, and I would add one more thing in this, like the traumatized by the betrayal, but yeah. Oh, okay, can you say more about that? I mean, they, I read this book, uh, the, Tra the Trauma Myth, where like a woman went and interviewed a whole bunch of people who had been, are you familiar with this book? Um. Va it like it was vaguely ringing a bell, but no. I just want to make sure I wasn't like repeating things you already knew. Um, <laughs> but she went and she she was like doing a PhD in trauma, and then she I, she as far as I could tell, she went into it with, like no really preconceptions. She was like, oh, I'm just going to interview people who have been sexually abused and like see how like the trauma works, like what are their narratives about it, and found that uh, the vast majority of people respond reported that the actual experience was not that bad. Like usually it's like bad, like, it's like uncomfortable or confusing or like a little weird, but like a lot of childhood experiences are like that. Um, and then in, once they became an adult and like figured out that the thing that had happened to them was bad, then they were like, oh, shit. Um, and the one, I think that this is like society being like, oh, my God, you were traumatized. But also there's a thing where it's like we're in a society where if an adult does that to you, like they're breaking the worst law possible, uh, which like indicates genuinely actually quite a lot of carelessness. Like that, that adult actually didn't care about you. So it's like becoming it's like growing up and then realizing that somebody that you thought you trusted, like really fucked you over. Uh, and that I think is actually genuinely really traumatizing, but I don't think that, um, that like the experience in childhood is inherently traumatizing for most people. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's a really hot take. Like that's going to be, that's going to be troubling for a lot of people because the, the, they're part of those documents and like part of the sort of like, um, social, um, push right now. Uh, seems to be like a lot of people have identified that the the breaking of old taboos and mores are happening sexually, right? So so uh, sa same sex attraction, all of that, no big deal anymore. We've moved into you know uh, trans identity is no big deal anymore. Um, you know people are asking what's next, right? So clearly minor attracted people like AKA pedophilia is being is being sort of like foregrounded as like hey maybe there's an, like a new way to think about that is um is that is that fair like as a context for what we're talking about right now i mean i guess i don't so i i don't think about it as like a thing i just I've always thought of i mean i can see the cultural discourse but for, for what it's worth i don't think we should like make it legal to molest kids i'm not like the conclusion of my argument here is not like woo just go for it like i don't think that's good <laughs> right so but then actively traumatizing people by telling them what happened to them was worse than what they think it is. Like, I think the correct response is to like, hear what happened and be like, how do you feel about that? And if the way they feel about that was bad, then that's fine. But like, don't like try and feed to them this narrative of how they should feel. Um, okay. Why, why not? Like, so, so what, what we're talking about then is leaving in, in place the, the world that, their abuser has created for them, right? So this is someone that has typically groomed them to to submit to abuse, especially like um, a a, pet, a person who has a pedophilic interest in children. Sometimes invests a lot of time and energy into into grooming, into making sure that that uh, that that relationship continues while they're interested. Typically, into pubescence or whatever, like whatever that particular person's like obsessional interest is sexually in that child. Uh, so, so like typically, in a therapeutic context, a, a therapist would would sort of like work with that person who had been sexually traumatized in childhood uh, to to break apart that conditioning, that grooming that had made it okay in the first place. Do you know what I mean? Uh, in theory, like vaguely. Okay. <laughs> okay. But so, so, but what you're saying is kind of the opposite that like the breaking, the, the sort of like uh, fragmenting, the chipping away at the, at the receptive identity that the groomer has created in the child, you're, you're kind of saying that that's creating the trauma for, for that, for that uh, survivor. Yeah, it depends a lot on the specifics, right? Like, I mean, if the 
if I if somebody came to me like, hey, like I was groomed by my, you know, like an older family member, I'd be like, so how do you feel about that? Like, what is your relationship to it? And then and then go from I don't know, because like maybe it's like really bad. Maybe they're like, this was fucked and like I want to fix it in my brain. And that seems that seems chill. And then like, yeah, let's go to a therapist. But if they're like, you know what, I think my life is fine. Then I'd be like, why should I tell you it's not fine? I don't know. Uh, typically there are consequences, whether or not that person feels like it's fine. And I mean, I think one of the coping mechanisms, it is a cope to sort of like reject the victim identity. Um, and, and that may, that, that coping strategy might work for a while, but it inevitably has a really, like it takes a, a major psychological toll on the person. So like you can't, you're kind of, you're acting like it's chill or like basically, you know, f fake it till you make it has like enormous, enormous internal costs. Um, and in reality, it isn't it isn't something that actually a, a person can integrate without breaking apart the conditioning of, of like the grooming or whatever, whatever is the reason that they do think it's chill. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I, I think I mean, I think you're making a good point, which is that there is sometimes people do a thing where something bad happens to you and you're like, I don't want to be the kind of person that bad things happen to. I'm going to pretend it didn't affect me. And right. you suppress it and you go on. And then it turns out that it's like coming out in other areas of your life. I think that this is true. This is like a thing that happens. I don't mean to dismiss that. Yeah. But, but also, I mean, like I was molested as a kid. And I'm like, for a while, I was like, oh, I must be fucked up about it. Uh, but it turns out it was fine. Like, <laughs> like not, I mean, it wasn't like fine, but like, there's so many other things that happened to me in childhood that were like orders of magnitude worse than like a little molestation. And then I just like, don't understand why people are like so freaked out about that tiny little thing. It, when I'm like, why are we not caring about the vast majority of other things that are worse? But I do remember when I like became like a teenager and adult and I realized the thing that had happened to me was bad. I went through like a process where I was trying to reframe everything in my life. Like, Oh, maybe this bad thing that I have is actually because that thing happened to me as a kid, like trying to like map meaning onto it. And I went through that for a few years before, like after doing more introspection, I was like, you know, I don't, I am trying to make it fit. I don't think it actually bothered me that much. Um, and part of it was like, I didn't feel like I had the allowance to be able to say it didn't bother me because for years I hadn't been exposed to anybody who like treated this sort of thing as like, it could be not a big deal. I'm not saying it necessarily is, just to be clear. I just don't want to be taken out of context here. But for yeah, me, yeah. it wasn't. Um, I think there's yeah. some people for whom this is true. I think that, I, I do think that we, so I I believe, I believe in agency. So like you, you are, you, you get, as you're an adult, you get to frame your reality the way that you want to. And I'm certainly not here to like try and break up anything that that constitutes sort of like the framework of of like how you you are you or the, the the sort of like narrative that you've constructed so that you can behave as an like as an agent in the world right as a subject rather than an object uh i think that that particular conversation that we're kind of trying to have right now in the context of like you sort of having become de facto like a pundit in in the space about like talking about sexuality is what's what's troubling to a lot, um, particularly a lot of women who, who've who sort of dealt with the downstream effects of, of uh, sexual abuse and, and like trafficking and, um, you know, uh, prostituted women and like uh, trying to help women exit those those industries and to like in a in a larger context the commodification and sexualization of children and women and and like you know women's reproductive labor all of that stuff like these are all like kind of like bigger things bigger topics than than uh i think can just be sort of like played with in in the frame of like um like sex and sexuality do you know what i mean you're saying that this these topics are like being used as weapons in a larger battlefield potentially absolutely yeah okay yeah <laughs> and i mean i'm not it's it's up to you whether whether you whether you accept sort of like the the call to like what you what you really are already is you're you're speaking in public about topics right and you're speaking from a certain position of authority in a way that being both experience and having uh, having positioned yourself as a researcher right so th those are those are both uh like fairly fairly intense uh, like positions of authority when when we're engaging in in uh, public discourse yeah uh sure 
<laughs> so of course, uh, what I'm saying is like, I think I, I would like for you to be a little bit more aware that, that, th that this is larger than just I, Ayla talking about Ayla and about Ayla's experiences and like context and so forth. You know what I mean? Like they, they, those are being like recontextualized <laughs> just like you've recontextualized your own abuse history. They're being recontextualized in the broader culture to, to potentially uh, advance certain narratives that are antisocial, that are destructive of, of um, like, you know, of like normal, healthy sexuality. And so like again to yeah be concrete, well, how so if you do you see like a concrete suggestion that you have for how to shift talking about it like if i would like to still communicate my experience and be honest is do you have like a sense for how you think it would be better to like change the way i'm talking about it uh i'm not sure yeah i'm not sure that's a good question i i think that obviously it's 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 going to be really difficult to talk about it um, without like with without being aware of the larger context of like the culture that you're speaking into right like you're speaking your truth but you're speaking into into a culture that's hungry for narratives of people enjoying their victimization that's what I'm saying to be right? clear I do want to say I did not enjoy it <laughs> okay but no, I no, I'm it not saying you small. enjoyed it but th there is a hunger there right like there's a sort of like sadistic pursuit societally of of, uh, of like targets of sexual interest that are incapable of consent and i think some of some of the conversations that you've had in podcasts do touch on that sort of like repeatedly lightly but repeatedly right like you you talked at a certain point about how um, one of the sort of like marketing strategies that worked quite well for you was sort of like the the implication that a man is making you do something that you don't want to do. Do you want to like kind of explain that? Because I'm sure I haven't said yeah. it properly. To, to be, yeah, to, it's like a slightly more nuanced than that. Um, I, I think uh, occasionally, especially when I'm talking live, I like say things in phrases that like I wouldn't, I would like, kind of want to go back and fix. This is why I like typing a lot more than I like talking. Um, so, but I think the actual thing that I mean here is that like, it's like other things that you don't want to do, but the sense of like uh, some sort of pressure, like some sort of actual contact. Um, and so it's like, oh, I like, uh, and this can be like quite minor. It's like, oh no, I don't want to spank myself. And then they're like, oh yeah, but you do. And then, you know, it's not, uh, it's like a, a more of a playful tone. I think M most guys, especially in my research, don't actually want to make women do things they don't want to do. It's a rare fetish. Right, right. You said you said that uh, most men aren't. Uh, I think you said most men aren't sociopaths that are like interested yeah. to, yeah, like to hurt women. Yeah, I think that's that's good. That's important, and that's a good clarification. Uh, but that's just like one example of like places mm -hmm. in which, for me, your your storytelling uh, about um, your experiences and your research touches on. Um, like these, these uh, sort of like I'm not going to say talking points, but like these like loaded concepts, right? Uh, yes, that seems true. Yeah, yeah. You also talk about um, how you had to like learn how to signal uh, like availability and seduction. Do you want to talk oh, about that a little oh, bit? Yeah. That, that, one, that is that is a little black pilly. <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of that. Yeah, I mean, like with like, if you want to make money as a cam girl, you have to like pretend to be dumber than you are and smile constantly, you know, uh, laugh at his jokes a lot. I mean, it's not like that uh, crazy a thing. I think all girls kind of know this a little bit. It's a little bit tropey, but I was a little depressed to find out the extent to which it was true. Right, because you you kind of like hit the scene and you wanted to not be that. You like wanted to be the smart girl that like you were hoping that there there would be buyers for that in a sense, right? Well, I was just myself. Like I was <laughs> like I was like a good live stream and I would just talk about stuff I was thinking about. Um, but but turns out you use sm smaller, simple words and talk slower. Men give you more money, and then you're like, Damn it. <laughs> the thing that I am is not the thing that is optimal for men to want to jerk off to. Right. Yeah. I think that's, that's a great, like, okay, perfect. Perfect. Let's talk about that. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about the creation of these like sexual persona. Have you, have you read much uh, Camille Paglia? 
I, I have it now. Okay. 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 <laughs> let's, let's talk about it in like really, we'll, we'll talk about it in really accessible terms. So, so what you described is like the construction of, of like a, a character or an entity that isn't, isn't really you. So you're like, you're creating mm -hmm. this, this uh, persona, uh, this avatar, what have you. And that's the thing that's being kind of like foregrounded, like shoved up in front, you know, on stage to be, to be bought and to be jerked off mm -hmm. over <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so um f like to my eye uh a lot of your research seems to be a kind of like um like marketing research in a way right like where you're asking questions that would allow you to uh to perfect that persona is that does that ring true mm, i don't think so oh, okay. i know i already know what the persona is my research is genuinely my own curiosity oh okay okay yeah Tell me about tell me about that. Tell me about what brought you to to uh, doing this kind of research. Uh, yeah. So to be fair, uh, very like earlier on, I did surveys that were interested in like finding out like what resulted in higher income. Like I would ask KOL girl stuff, but I haven't done that in a long time. And so, since then, there were a couple things that got me started with sex research specifically. One is like, I think I did like a short survey a long time ago, and then I found out that women reported being much more interested in submissive, and then men were not as interested in being dominant. Like there's greater demand for female submission than there is for male doms uh, or there's greater supply or whatever. And then that was shocking to me. I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Um, and that started the whole like confusion. And then other is like, I have like some weird fetishes that I wanted to find out. how. Okay. No, no, let's, let's start. Like there's a lot there already. <laughs> okay. So, so you found out that more women want to be submissive than there are men willing to, to dom them. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Tell me about how you arrived at that conclusion. Oh, I'm trying to remember the original because I mean it's been I've it's been replicated a billion times. I'm trying to remember the original one. The original I think I, I it was just like a basic kink survey where I asked people like, are you interested in this or that? And then yeah. But I've, it's been I've done a, several kink surveys since then where it's been the same. I've gotten it from different uh, sources, so like my audience versus TikTok audience versus randomized people that I've paid for uh, that are like test, official test takers. Like all of them, the trend is the same and about the same ratio. Um, yeah, isn't it weird? I mean, it's it is uh, it is weird. <laughs> it is yeah. weird. But like, I'm trying not to. I'm trying not to like put myself in it because it's like it doesn't speak to me at all, right? Or my experiences, or those of my yeah. friends. But I cultivate a very particular like kind of milieu, you know. Like clearly, <laughs> uh, I'm interested in like female strength and and uh, and beauty and self development and. And agency and like intellectualism and and create creativity and those kind of things so uh like sexuality is a part of that it isn't like the thing it isn't like the the front line top thing and certainly modulating uh you know our response anyway i have i have an a priori assumption about that conclusion obviously right? but, but, but you don't think that the ratio is there I think that I'm not sure that you're measuring what you think you're measuring. And I think that it is a kind of like um, the, the tool creates its own measurement, right? Like you're, you're online, you're talking to potentially chronically online people and certainly sexual practices online are very different from sexual practices in person typically. Yeah. But, but let's, let's take it. Like if you wanted to figure out a way to do a study with like a pretty big sample size, to find out uh, the rates of like submission dominance. And to be clear, the rates of submission, it depends on how you define submission and like the different subtypes, but it's roughly around 60% of women are interested in some form of submission. So I'm not saying it's like a vast, I'm not saying it's like 90%, like a little over half, uh, just to be clear. Uh, okay. But if you were, if you wanted to do a thing, a survey to figure out like the, the general rates, like how would you design it? I have no, I have no interests. Like I, I left uh, social science research behind a long time ago. I, I took I took quite a bit of education in it, and I uh, I think that it's actually very difficult, if not impossible, to uh, to really make knowledge out of the those like signals. You know, I think it's it's people are notoriously terrible at reporting on their own like inner phenomena. Uh, people are notoriously like <laughs> there. There's like many many ways. Uh, t many things that complicate that and many, many extraneous um, sort of like, yeah, signals that, that you're sure to capture. And for me, it isn't, I'm not sure how relevant it is to, to me, like, it, you know, in, in my life or in my philosophy or in my embodying of my philosophy, um, like, t uh, this is like, it's, 
to, to, to sort of like try to quantify what is to me a very manufactured culture that isn't, it isn't like growing up out of the people that participate in it. It's being imposed from the top down. I don't know why, why would I do that? You know? Sure. But I mean, you have like presumably ideas about the world, how it works anyway. And yeah. you could like give me anecdotes, like in your experience when you've talked to, and I could give you different anecdotes because I have a very different community. And so right. the question is, which one of our communities is more representative? Right. Or like, like, so if you want to actually- is it, is it the question? Like, why, why do we care? Like, why is it important that we're describing what um, sort of like the putative pseudo majority is reporting that they do? Like, why is that important or interesting? Well, I mean, if we want to know what most people are into, and, and you could be like, well, it's manufactured by culture or it's, you know, innate. We could have that debate. But that's a kind of separate from the question of like how many people make their peepees get hard when they think of like this kind of fantasy. And that just feels interesting to me. Um, it feels very, it feels very like sort of solipsistic and navel gazing to me, right? Like there are there are larger questions, but if we're focused on hard ons, like I, okay. Like, I don't know. Like if, if we can, if there's like something bigger, some bigger question of what it is to be human that we can find in that, I want to get to that. Not, right. you know, but, but the thing is like I said in my surveys, uh, regardless, like uh, replicated across a whole bunch. It's also replicated in other like professional research. It seems to be pretty regular that more women are interested in submission than men are dominant. And you're saying that like, well, we can't trust this um, because like, I wish it's just like fine if we can't trust it, but if you're going to dismiss it, I want to know like what, like on what grounds you're dismissing it. Like what other thing do you feel like is more trustworthy than that? That's all. Uh, yeah, no, I'm wow. Okay. So we got here already. So why I'm dismissing it is that, um, there is a there's like a pornified culture that your your generation and mine have grown up on like you know being basically de facto the sex education happens in the form of like accessing online pornography oh, right okay. so it is is it that you think that like uh the people that we're surveying have watched porn and thus their uh, preferences are modified Right. That's one, that's one aspect. Absolutely. Yes. And right. I think that they're, they're performing a kind of sexuality when you're asking them, they're, they're involved in a performance for you and they're, and for each other and to create community. But that's also an observable, an observable phenomenon that people will accept uh, things that they find ethically or morally or even aesthetically repugnant because they're more interested to be part of the community, uh, like kink, fetish, okay. and and um, polyamory so being among them. Aroused by it, or that they are actually? Wait, I'm confused. If you are they are they actually aroused by the things, or are they just like thinking they're aroused by it? Are they actually aroused by the things? Why why is that the question? So like, why is arousal? <laughs> Like, <laughs> I think that people can be conditioned to be aroused by all sorts of stimuli, right? Including watching uh, dogs get tortured. I think people can be conditioned to to be, uh, you, you know, like there's there's this whole like behaviorism thing, like. Of course, but why would we be? Why why are we fascinated by that? Why why are you interested in it? Why? Is the culture interested in you talking about it right now? Those are those are my questions. Well, I was just trying to figure out what your worldview is, like what my worldview is. Well, because which... we're just talking about like wh why you find like these studies to be like meaningless, and then I'm like because the, because you don't feel like it's reflecting the thing that you care about. Which they're is not the... meaningless. They're they're being done, and so clearly they're important to some people, and they're being they're being foregrounded. These conversations are being thrust. Uh, it, you know, like you've been, you've been on many podcasts, people are interested in what you have to say. So clearly it's not meaningless. I'm saying it's not, they're not significantly measuring anything that uh, like it's, I, I have a, a problem with the idea that, that you're, that you're synthesizing knowledge out of anything real. I think that it's a closed loop, right? I think that you're basically giving yourself Rorschach tests by like looking at cum stains on the wall. So what question would you like to be asked? <laughs> I, I'm asking you questions and I want to know how, how we got here, how we arrived here. So it's not that 
it's not that I want to be asked questions. It's not that I oh, think sorry, that I meant, what, what I'm you, like, the holder of the truth. Sorry, it's what I meant to say. <laughs> like, 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 on, so we're measuring like, oh, you know, what makes your faith be hard? What kind of porn do you like? What are roses you write? But you're saying that this is like besides the point. This is not the uh, important thing about the culture. So, so what it's is not? It's not what it's not what I'm I'm trying to get at. I'm trying to get at what's happening in the culture that's making this conversation important. Do you know what I mean? Like the conversation about what about those people about about that we're we're quantifying that we're supposedly quantifying what arouses people, and because you said PPs get hard, that we're supposedly quantifying some sort of uh, male sexuality. Oh, that... I was being a little tongue in cheek, to be clear. Pardon? <laughs> I, was being a little I was being a little tongue in cheek. Oh. <laughs> I mean, that's totally fair. I think if that's if that's what we're talking about, that's what we're talking about. I don't have a problem with it. And and I, I'm not trying to like I do think sexuality is important. Obviously, it's one of like, you know, the major human preoccupations. But so like to be clear, I'm not I'm not so much interested in the content of your research. Right. Just because for me, that would be like asking, you know, um, a drug company marketing executive about like the health and safety data on their, you know, like novel medical intervention. It's, it's, it, you literally have perverse incentives is what I'm saying, you know? I mean, so people would have perverse incentives to the, and I'm that's okay. Them. That's okay. That's okay. I'm not like, I, I really want to kind of just like move beyond that, like move past okay. that because it's not, for, for me, that's not even like close to the most interesting thing about you. <laughs> like, I don't, you know, Okay. does that make sense? It, sure, we can move on. Like, like, but just because I'm not, I'm not buying what you're selling, and I'm not part of the the worldview that that would privilege that as any kind of knowledge. Those are the those are the two reasons I don't want to engage about it. I, I mean, I can cite research that's not mine. That's okay. Like, that helps. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. So, getting back to getting back to you. So, when when did you find that your your research and your way of talking about sexuality was kind of being like picked up by a lot of people like what's like the first encounter that you had that made you realize oh what I'm saying is is really is really important to people and people really want to engage with it I don't I don't remember uh I mean it's like it depends on what the threshold is of people paying attention I think the original thing that got views was the the survey where I measured like the frequency of kinks by how taboo people rated them so I, okay. I did two surveys where I gave people a list and I said, how, how taboo do you think society views this thing? And then I gave another and said, like, are you personally into this thing? And then f charted the, the correlation. So you can see things that are like disproportionately taboo given their popularity and like less taboo given their popularity. And that one was the first thing that went viral. I think it was like maybe 2018 or 19, I think. And what kind of things, uh, what kind of things that people pick out that they really, that they really wanted to engage with about it? Like what, what are the, like into like let's get into the content like what were the kinks that like maybe surprised people or were uh were that novel thing that we talked about at the beginning of the conversation is it, I mean, signifying some truth like feet was less uh taboo given the popularity um like people don't find feet to be that like freaky like if you say feet, you're like a little weird but not crazy um but it's like given that like, it wasn't super common uh there's also, a lot of people like we are, are really outraged about the fact that I'm researching some of the more taboo ones, like necrophilia, or uh, like people are like, ah, oh, you know, they see the charts and then they get like really offended. Um, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I don't. There's there hasn't been a ton of in, individual stuff though. I don't remember. This is also a while ago. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, I think I think that's one of the ones that like came across my feed, and I was like, wow, like that's. <laughs> that's a lot that's <laughs> what made you what made you decide to ask those questions was it was it things that you were coming across uh during your sort of um uh, it, like engagement or interaction with sex work no not really it not, doesn't have a lot to do with sex work because uh, sex work is mostly pretty vanilla in my experience um it's just like better for business it's just, like the, the the niche fetishes don't really pay that much um, so if you want to make money, you want to be like the every girl, the super like no tattoos, long hair, you know, minimal makeup sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it wasn't didn't really come out of my sexual experience. I was just curious. Um, I forget why I asked about tabooness. I because I originally came with this idea like many years ago, so I don't I don't actually remember what sparked it. <laughs> do you do you have an interest in sort of like breaking down some taboos? Do you think that that 
that that's a worthwhile sort of like a project of how you want to engage with the larger community? I mean, it depends on the taboo. If it's a, I, I don't like, I like taboos that are against things that are harming people. Mm -hmm. That seems good. Uh, if it doesn't harm people, then I'm like pretty chill with it. Uh, <laughs> I, and I think it's like, cause you know, I grew up with so much sexual shame. I know a lot of people who also have, and uh, a lot of the things like having sex with people is something that would have been considered hugely taboo in my original culture. Um, and I'm, I feel much better and freer now that I'm like, you know what? I'm not wrong for the thing that I'm experiencing. As long as I'm not hurting anyone, I, anything I feel is okay. That's great. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yes, I think that, uh, I can't, I can't disagree with that. And I'm honestly, I'm not trying to disagree with you. I just like, don't want to, like, I don't want to be untrue to who I am either. Right. Like I want to find out who you are, but I also don't want to, um, like, you know, experience such a per perspective shift that I have to like stretch way out of who the fuck I am to, to like accept some of what you're saying, you know? Um, but yeah, so, so taboos. Yeah. I, I certainly would agree with you that, uh, you know, an obsessional sexual interest with inanimate objects or, or feet or even, uh, dead things, it doesn't have the power to hurt another person, but I would say that those are, that those, interest can hurt the person who's experiencing them, right? Especially if, if they're causing a disturbance in that person's everyday life, if they're uh, uh, like incapable of engaging in sort of like normal, healthy sexuality, would you? Yeah, I think it's a little sad. Like I have an obligate fetish, which is really annoying. Like there's like a thing that I'm into that it's just difficult for me to get off without it. And it really reduces the amount of like sexual experience I can have. And you know, if I could like press a button and also become aroused by normal shit, I really like that. <laughs> Yeah, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. <laughs> uh, do you think that like interacting with uh, with perverts online has like shifted your sense of your own sexuality? I mean, maybe it's maybe more selfish, which I think is good. Yeah. Like, I mean, I think this is common for a lot of young women. Like you grow up into your sexuality and you desperately want to be liked by men. And so you sort of like suppress who you are and like pretend that you like like the thing that they're into and you really don't. And and it was like a little bit of a reverse, reverse, bleh, reversal for me because like I became an escort and I was like having sex with men for money and just doing a whole bunch of stuff that like I didn't organically like love. <laughs> you know, I'm like I, the whole experience of being like attuned to what do you want, like trying to figure out exactly what would make them like you the most. Um, and then after after that, I would like date in my personal life. And then when I would have sex with those people, I would realize how much I was doing that in my personal life. I was like, Oh, I noticed now that I'm doing this professionally, I see how much I'm like putting aside my own desires. And then I just stopped that. I was like, you know what, if this is not something I actually fucking like, I'm just not going to have sex. And I stopped like trying to work myself. And dude, ever since then, my sex has been so much better. Cause I'm just like, I just, I just don't anymore. I'm just like, it's, this is going to be for me or it's just fuck off. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> Great, great. As a female supremacist, I have to approve. Yeah. Obviously, I, I will. I will suppress myself for you, but you got to pay me a lot of money to do it. Okay, I want to be coming out of this interaction happy with my end of the, the bargain. Right, right. I think that speaks to a baseline kind of uh, transactionality. That's just facts, right? Like I think mm -hmm. in this culture, there's transactionality inherent in almost everything. Even even sort of like conventional relationships have a certain transactionality about them. Um, and for me, that again is not is not like um, uh, that's an artifact of like externally imposed, like, you know, top down culture. Not I don't think that people prefer to engage that way. And I think that that we should be making more room for, you know, for real affinity and, and like attraction and like that, that style of getting together. But I, I can sympathize with, with like just how much transactionality is out there. Like to break, to break through that, um, like, do you, have you, is it possible? To break through transactionality? Yeah. To, to just, to just feel like just real affinity for someone and to like that there isn't, like the transactionality is just completely just shed from, from every interaction with them. No, no. I mean, it depends on what you mean by transactionality. And like, uh, well, what but, you described is like, uh, give me money and I'll do what you want. And then another level is you do this for me and I'll do this for you. Right. Like, and any version of that, of like 
this back and forth where like, oh, what do you bring to the table? Oh, this is what I, br-. is there like, it's just like a natural flow of like a, like a blending of two consciousnesses that like elevate each other and, and, you know, build something together. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess like maybe it's like the proximity of the transaction. Like, let's say you're like a husband and wife married for a long time. You deeply love each other. Like one of you like gets sick for two years and the other person's like, you know what? It doesn't matter. You're my husband. I love you. And they care for it. Right. Like that would be maybe be our like ideal of like non-transactionality. Um, but so maybe, but like ultimately, like, like if you're in a relationship with the guy and then, and like being with them is like too great a burden, like maybe you would leave. Uh, and like, maybe that's fine. Like you have to care for your own needs. Like at some point, if it's not like meeting your needs and your life is fucking miserable, like you need to care for yourself um, to some degree. So like ultimately it's kind of transactionally there, but it's like more padded out. It's like, it's like a lot of like a vague give and take. And then it's like the thing that triggers the leaving is like, do I feel sufficiently bad? Whereas like with the money for sex thing, it's like, <laughs> it's like very in your face, you know? So are, are you saying like, like, can we go really far in the direction where the transactionality is padded out? Because like in a world with no zero transactionality, this means that there can be like infinite bad feelings, but still commitment. Oh, like, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. And that seems kind of bad to me. Like it's some you need to at some point have a boundary. Right, right, right. Okay, I see what you're saying. No, I and I do mean in an interpersonal relationship, whether that's a lover or a friend or or like a, a life partner or a co-parent. Like, is it possible? Is it possible to to have like so much affinity, like so much, um, just like desire for that person's like whole self that there isn't any feeling of like what what can I get in return or like what you know that 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 that, that you're that you're like constantly like oscillating between the two positions like yours and theirs and together like sort of blending into almost like one unit that moves through life together i mean i, mean, I think a lot of people would report having this for their children right like lots of people are like unconditional love it doesn't matter and my guess is it's like actually not unconditional like i think if like the child you know like bombed a whole bunch of people and then like they had a stroke so their personality totally changed and then they went and they tried to kill you like maybe you'd be like okay I'm not like like, obviously there's limits but I think you can get pretty far in that direction it's probably parent parent child relationships right right yeah no no doubt but like as two equals do you think it's possible or do you think that we're always compromising and that the basis of that compromise is some kind of transactionality I mean I I, I don't understand the question because like if you go far enough in one direction eventually you have to drop a boundary otherwise it's bad like like at some i do have requirements like if you want to be deeply close to me you have to like not bomb a bunch of people and then like try to kill me like i do have (laughs) no obviously obviously. like there's something there is criteria i'm saying like like you can't have infinitely no criteria i mean you can't you just like it's probably not a good idea so i mean like like, what's your question like where do we draw the line no, I mean, I obviously the criteria, I mean, like, obviously there's a prerequisite and that that prerequisite would be that you're dealing with like two, um, you know, like not sociopaths and like, you know, like two fairly like psychologically normal and steady human beings <laughs> who are both, you know, to, on a path towards like self-actualization or enlightenment or whatever. Right. Like that's kind of the, the context that I was trying to frame, but <laughs> fair enough. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> I, I, practice, I think there are people who probably have gone through life, not experiencing the sensation of trying to do transactional things with their partner. And this has been really sustainable. I think this okay. is that, Sort of thing as possible right and is that something that that you seek or that you that you would like for yourself or are you interested in that sort of like relational thing at all uh, yeah uh, i am okay i'm like, <laughs> sorry oh, did that did that surprise you <laughs> and no i just i guess maybe a bit i'm like is just anybody not want this right 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 yeah 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 that's that's exactly what I'm getting at. Yes. Yes, exactly. And it, I'm, I'm drawing on something you said in an interview about um, that there was like, you were having a conversation about the sort of like dating and sexuality and that like um, how you, you said this thing about like, yeah, I'm never going to be, you have to like be okay with losing at the game. And how you said like you were gonna you were kind of pissed off that you're never gonna be like the, the hottest nineteen year old forever or whatever. Do you remember that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> and uh, and that like ultimately that that's that's what life is all about is like engagement in that in that game, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so then obviously my question would be like is 
but what is the purpose then like of the end of that game or is is that does that game ever end or are you just like constantly creating like you know like you maxing out the attributes that would make the character that's playing that game the most successful right like where do you get what i'm saying i mean it's kind of an infinite game like the point of the game is to play not to win and like there's there's a way where it like kind of sucks when you're not like when you're failing at the game but like I don't know. I, I enjoy the journey. Yeah, but isn't winning the game like finding that person that that the transactionality is over, and then you're creating something together, yeah, whether it's I a mean, family or? I well, okay. I think when I'm talking about like the the infinite game, I'm like referring a, like a little bit more like in an abstract spiritual sense, and like I'm using the oh. hot night field as an example. Like if I find like the the guy, like the hottest guy, and I'm like I'm the hottest nineteen year old. There's gonna be something else. Like it's a hedonic treadmill. Like where I am right now, if you showed me where I am like ten years ago, I would be floored. I'd be like, that's it. You've made it. That's gonna be the peak of the world. Because like ten years ago, I was like, working in a factory floor. Like fuck that shit. <laughs> I'd, I'd be like, holy shit, you, you're like, you're like wealthy beyond my wildest dreams. And like now, I feel like I'm poor. It's crazy. Like you get to where it is, and you're just like, it's just the infinite uphill trudge of trying to get like some place that's better than where you are now. Right, and that would be like material comfort. It, it could. I don't know anything. It's just the, you're just going to be in desire, and this whatever the thing is you desire changes. Oh, I see. So you, you're saying like as you attain the thing, the there's like a new target. Like you're kind of continually yeah. moving the goalposts on yourself. Okay. Without yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I get what you're saying. And and do you do you think that there's fulfillment at any stage of those attainments? You know, I think the fulfillment is in accepting the trying, like. For, for me, I had like a big shift from where I was like, oh, the thing that's going to make me feel fulfilled is getting it. Right. And now I've shifted to like, oh, the thing that's making me fulfilled is the attempt. So oh. I am already quite fulfilled in some deep way where I, I just like the experience of being like of the scramble of like, I am, I'm not, I don't have the thing. And that's kind of nice. <laughs> okay. Say more. Why? Why is it nice? What about it? Like, I, well, this is interesting. There's something like, I mean, we might get like a little like abstract. Yes, yes, here. yes, <laughs> yes. This is like a philosophy channel, supposedly. So let's go. Let's okay. do it. <laughs> uh, but there's something like, um, like, uh, like at one point I experienced like a quite a lot of peace because that was the thing I wanted. Like, oh, I want to be at peace. I want to be, and and it was very much like being dead because like if if you are completely okay in this moment with like no you kind of lose the future and you lose the past. You're like, this is it. Uh, And it's, and it became almost like nothingness in a sense. And it was great. I highly recommend it. But, and then I decided like, okay, is this how I want to be? Is, is this actually the thing I want to be in a state of complete like peace and loss of suffering? Um, And then I realized like, actually, no, now that I have it, the thing that I want is to experience attachment. I want to feel what it's like to suffer because it's interesting. One, it's like being alive is, to be a person, to, to have, to be like a thing that's not everything else. Like you have to, there's some like sort of fundamental agony in the separation. There's like a fundamental agony in like, in the process of time, there's a fundamental agony in just like not having the thing that you want. Um, and then I stopped viewing that as like a problem and then started viewing that as the point. Like the point is to be alive and part of being alive is the agony. So I'm here, I'm here to be alive, all of it. I love it. Hell yeah. Like, (laughs) yes. I'm co-signing on all of that. I I love that. I love that we got there. Yes, 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 exactly. (laughs) But I'm glad that it seems to make sense to you. Do you you also? Of course it does. Yeah, yeah. I do. I do. Like I have, I'm very, um, you know, I'm very tough on myself and I try to be very like uh, giving and accepting of others because I, I hold myself to the highest standard. And that's always like a goal just outside my reach, right? Because the more capable I am, the more I expect of myself, right? So I totally, I totally get that. And there's a, for me, I apply, I, I am quite hedonistic in, in some aspects of my life. Like I could, I could see myself pursuing pleasure, like, you know, um, sort of like limitlessly. I, I, my, the way that I'm made, I'm very capable of experiencing a lot of um, a lot of pleasure, and I've had a lot of wonderful experiences in my life. But the pursuit of pleasure, it turns out for me, is not enough. So I 
apply like extreme self-discipline to other forms of my life. And that turns out to be much more, uh, much more inter in interesting and much more integrating and much more um, like valuable to me than just the pursuit of pure pleasure. And then the two, the, that, that duality, right. Of, of pleasure and pain of like suffering and attainment. Like, absolutely. I think that oscillation between the two is probably like where I'm finding my balance. So yeah. <laughs> like a hundred percent spoke to me. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's a good yeah, thing. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people say that and they're like, okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I I would I would guess that that people maybe aren't prepared to hear to hear some of that, right? Like they I mean, that's why I wanted to have this conversation with you and like open it up beyond the topics that you've been so extensively questioned about, right? Because you're clearly a very capable thinker and I want to know more about what's what's behind there like where wh what are your drives like where where are you going right like where have you been where are you going those sorts of things right yeah <laughs> definitely a formidable female force I would say so yeah that's that's why that's why I want to know I want to know uh like what are some of the practices that you have that that bring you peace and that help you to sort of like integrate everything that that you've experienced and learned I'm over peace. I'm done being peace. Uh, I try to avoid <laughs> like even for a minute, you're not allowing yourself like even like a little bit of downtime. <laughs> well, I mean, like, like you know, like to to be clear, like when I mean peace, I don't. I also mean a thing that like is at peace with a lot of you know pain or intensity. It's just like the part, like the deep part of you that's okay. Um, and I'm yeah. I'm. Just, I'm not, I don't, I like occasionally I'll meditate every now and then, but usually it's for troubleshooting purposes, not for like, say more. <laughs> I mean, you know, sometimes you get like a hangup about something or like you get triggered by something and you're like, oh man, I should probably go like figure out what that's about. And then you go and have to sit down and go like, look at it, you know? Um, oh, in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is that like somebody who's just going at a shaker cup in the back? <laughs> the, the cat is the auto, oh. auto <laughs> dispenser. <laughs> Yeah, meditation. Um, and is that like, uh, yeah? How did you how did you arrive at that? Like, you you seem pretty methodical in the way that you apply like various modalities. So how did you how did you decide that like meditation was the thing? Well, I mean, I so I didn't actually mean it for it to be meditation. I just there's like a thing where it's it's kind of like um, let's say you have like you're in a house and then in one room like something falls over and then you have to go open the door and like look in there and like what the fuck is that it's just like it seems like the thing to do and then but if you do it internally people call that meditation like something oh. falls over and you're like okay wait what was that and you go like like that for a while and then right, and so you like get still and then you quietly observe the, you know yeah 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 so like a kind of metacognition you're trying to observe yourself observing the phenomenon of like whatever's happening in your life yeah like Close, yeah, or yeah, yeah and usually it requires like sitting there and then just like doing that for a bit. Um, which is what I was doing on psychedelic when I used to do psychedelics, so I would do that a lot, yeah, yeah. I, me too, <laughs> oh, nice. yeah, yeah. I definitely there, like, I had a, a time where I was like a psychonaut, I just thought, like, oh no, I'm not. I don't want to explore out there. I want to explore in here. I want to like get deep with myself. I want to That's figure good. Out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you, but for me, I found that those like self insights, like, I mean, that's anyway, uh, weren't durable, right? Like I would come out of the trip and be like, oh my God, like, yes, I, I know everything. And I spoke to the ancestors and whatever. And then like three days later, the same old shit would be happening in my life. <laughs> but, like, yeah. I think, it, I think it's highly variable. So when I took LCI, I was like, oh, this is the best thing ever. I fed it to a lot of people. And it turns out they had very different responses. I think just there's something about my brain that makes cells day work for me. And for me, the insights were lasting. Like they like actually like I had clear very large shifts in my life and my behavior that were permanent, um, but it depends on who like for some people it just strikes differently and like maybe like a different drug would be better for you. Some people report they get. Yeah, like, I mean, psilocybin for me is really good. I get along very well with it. Yeah, oh, not yeah. so much LSD and not ketamine. I don't know. Have you tried ketamine? I, I'm not a big ketamine fan. <laughs> no, <I've never. laughs> no. I have a lot of friends who like it. I just it's like okay. <laughs> I think ketamine seems like from from friends that I've watched, um, like take it therapeutically, it seems to really help people sort of like integrate some trauma or or like have have the distance from the experience, like viscerally to kind of examine it. 
Uh, but other than that, no, I'm not, I'm not usually like interested in feeling less. I'm like, I want to be more present. I want to be feeling more. So yeah, same with like any, anything that is like a depressant, like alcohol, or I I don't really have experience with opiates, but it seems like a similarly kind of like shutting, shutting down of the sensory apparatus. Not, not super interesting to me, but yeah. So I do like alcohol, but that's because I like feeling more, I'm like bad at being socially gregarious and alcohol helps me do that but are you hard. i don't think you are like we're having a great conversation i don't know yeah but this is this is like a narrow so i i have like really weird hang-ups around socialization this mm-hmm. is like a goal well, this is recorded we have purposes you have questions it's structured uh very different but if you're at a party what the fuck are you doing you just walk around and you're like what's the goal i don't know that's like why i started developing ask hole which is the card game the question card game i have because I would be going to parties and be like, I don't know what the fucking point is. So I just start writing their questions and then doing the live service. Yeah, cool. yeah. yeah. Uh, do you want to talk about that, your game? As well, yeah. It's a, I, I co-founded it with, I guess he's Moon Boy on Twitter. Um, it's a de- question of cards, deck a card. Yes, deck of, the words I'm saying make sense, presumably. Uh, and we've selected the question as based on... Um, like really large data set. So I had like a collection of many thousands of questions and then a whole bunch more open-ended ones. And we did a bunch of play testing and had a bunch of people rate them on how much they would want to hear other people answer, not yourself, very different. Um, and then we, we assigned some points for like, if they were more likely to split 50-50 of respondents. So the questions there are more likely to split the room in half are more likely to be answered differently by gender. So some of the ones like men and women really disagree on. And that was like, those were more likely to be incorporated in the deck. Uh, that's really yeah, interesting. Great. I think it's the best one. I've like tried a bunch of the competing question ones and by far Askhole is just, it's just really good. <laughs> Way better. Really, where can we find it? Is it like already? Askhole.io. A-S-K-hole.io. Yeah, you can just order. That's a great name. Do you want to do, like we have 20 minutes. Do you want to like do a few questions? Do you have it handy? Oh it's, no! I, there's, a, there's an app online. It's free. You can just okay. go to ask and you can join the same room. Um, I I am like a little sick of the ask all questions because we made it oh, years yeah. ago. And but I mean we can't. We can't. <laughs> Do you remember any that like? Are there any that st- stood out that you we could like? You know just what I mean? One of one is one of my favorites is like, what's your most controversial opinion according to your peer group? Because um, then you learn about one. your group and them. I, like, if you had to fuck a cow, would you rather fuck a dead cow or a live cow? Uh, no, that, that's a terrible question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, from like, the Balkans. Like, every, if you ask that question at any party that my family was at, they'd, they'd be like, "This is a degenerate. Like, we have to leave. Like, this is like." <laughs> yeah, it's a very degenerate deck of cards. <laughs> Uh, okay. Well, okay. It's that say a sex worker has sex with a man under expectation of payment. When he leaves, he takes the money back, steals it, and runs. Does this count as rape? Yes. Yeah. So this around twenty percent of people say yes. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Who says no? Uh, other people. <laughs> 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 okay. Other people. Yeah. People without a sense of ethics, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I think it's just people have really different conceptions about like how transactions work and like what counts as rape or not. I like I did like a rape survey for where we had a bunch of and I think that was one of the questions where we gave like kind of unclear scenarios, like people could interpret it either way and how people rank them. People are people yeah, people there's just like a lot of elements in that kind of scenario that like really push at people's intuitions of how society works. So yeah, the, you're so right about that. That's actually an interesting uh, conversational. I had one of that was one of my kind of like question arcs that I was going put, to potentially try to work in was uh, there. There is a lot of good research on that. Um, <laughs> uh, men reporting on themselves, basically. And a lot of men have said in, in these various surveys that if they could get away with raping a certain woman that they would. Uh, have you seen this? I haven't. Did they use the word rape? Uh, no, no, that's a good catch. Yeah, no, I think they use some sort of like scenario where like the, the woman was incapacitated on incapable of consent. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Is that something that, that you've seen in your research as well? I haven't, but I haven't asked that specific question. I've asked people if they're aroused by the thought of rape, like doing that. Um, but without using the word, I use like, uh, like have sexually, you know, yeah. Yeah, um, but yeah. usually the, the 
usually still a very high percentage of men are interested in that, which is why I'm like surprised. I would want to see read the methodology to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I should have I should have queued it up to to show you. Uh, another thing that was interesting to me, and this is like one of those magazine surveys. Uh, again, dubious, but like for me, interesting because of the question, because of the like the the opportunity to engage about the topic rather than like again. Obviously, I don't believe that they're measuring anything, but the but it's an, an important question that's being circulated in in the culture, um, and that is uh, so men were asked about like what is their like peak sexual experience uh, with with a woman, and they were given um, like a series of options, and the one that the most men like over ninety percent characterized as like their top tier like like peak sexual experience was uh giving giving a woman uh like a really extraordinary orgasm like particularly making a woman squirt like that was like a peak sexual experience for for men <laughs> so <I can> see <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah what do you think what do you think why do you think that is do you think that men want to give women pleasure like let's talk about that yeah i think so I mean, I think it's like generally like high male status is like, you know, the woman, the, the trope of the woman like leaves the bedroom stumbling and being like her hair messed up. And like now she's like hooked on his penis because penis <laughs> Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. That's very much like yeah. the male ego, which is actually kind of nice. I, I like that. I like that. And I really found that with my escorting too. I found that probably roughly 80% of men seemed like genuinely interested in like giving me sexual pleasure. Like that was, it was aligned with their own pleasure to yeah. give me pleasure, which that is nice. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that to me speaks of like a, a real kind of like pro-social sexuality, right? Like mm -hmm. one where, where it's like bonding is possible and, and like, you know, like clearly mutuality is, is possible. Uh, did you, were they able to tell when you were faking orgasms? <laughs> I, if they did, I don't think they said it. Right. Some, some, I got the impression like it just doesn't even matter. Like some people you just... <laughs> Like they just clearly, but it's a minority to be clear. There's like definitely where you're like, you're, you're banging them and they have a very misguided view of like women's responses during sex. Uh, they, the, like there is such a thing as like kind of being trained on porn. I think I'm like more like bearish on how much I think porn is like fucking at men's brains, but there's a subset where I do suspect that this is true. Uh, and I encountered that. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, like what kind of things were their expectations where it didn't meet reality? So like, like coming happens really fast. Right. Um, this is a big one. Like you don't have to do that much or like, like going straight in or like assuming a lot of the, the problems was when they seemed to uh, try to fit me into their fantasy as opposed to actually listening to what I was doing. So they would um, uh, like be like, Oh, do you like that? You like that. Like that kind of thing. They would be like, start like fingering me really hard and be like, this is this is you clearly you like that and and it didn't feel like it gave me room to kind of subtly indicate that like maybe I'm not responding um it's almost like they were trying to like narratively pressure me into liking the experience again I want to radiate it this was pretty rare but when it did happen it was I really didn't like it um, yeah yeah do you find that those men were less uh, uh experienced like in in I terms don't know. of yeah, no. I, it's, it's, I don't. I don't. I. I tried to ask some questions during the thing and like record it, but you can't do like official surveys. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. Like for me, for me, anecdotal and evidence is actually more interesting than surveys. Like you know, yeah. because people people reporting on their reality that you know that's that's a story, that's a narrative that has like a beginning, middle, and end, and then you've made sense of it afterwards. So I'm I'm more I'm more likely to pr privilege that more highly as uh, as knowledge making than than surveys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like a diff different. I just like don't trust self report, like like narrative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I get you. Not not in the sense of I'm not gonna like take someone's complete word for it, but like the way that they choose to tell the story is also kind of like telling about it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> what kind of uh, sexual practices um, like do we find in the wild, like that are destructive of female bodies? I mean, like, doing things that she doesn't want, clearly. Like, if she's like, I don't like that, and you're like, I'm going to do that anyway, not good. That seems destructive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about anal sex? I found there's, like, this huge pro proliferation of interest by men uh, in women giving them access to 
their booty holes. And yeah, this is uh, one of the, the big gaps. I mean, I, I know you don't trust my survey research. No, no, that was- that's fine. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, to be fair, okay, if you're going to doubt some of it, you have to doubt all of it equally. This I is do. Like a rule of-, of course. But, of course. but, in but, but tell me your story. <laughs> <laughs> this was one of the big gaps is that men were much more interested in anal sex than women were. Um, like one of the biggest differences in in fetishes, which you you need to also doubt this. You're not allowed to you're not allowed to quote this <laughs> unless you quote my other shit. <laughs> but um, I did, I didn't find it in person. No, my not in like, person. Yeah, my, I mean I think it's like not quite a good a thing because like the 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 situation is a little bit different when it comes to escorting versus in person because people are like much more careful about what to request of escorts because um, like you don't. It's like a professional businesswoman, right? You don't want to like go in and be like, you know, she's going to give you reviews for other women later. Um, yeah, yeah. Some of them kind of ask, but nobody really expected it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for me, that was like a revelation because it, there was like a whole series of articles in Teen Vogue a few years ago for for like very young girls, for like, you know, teenage girls uh, on like how to prepare themselves for receptive anal sex. And that, that again, made the rounds through my feminist circles. Like, we'll look at this like degradation of, of you know, like women. And of course, in the porn industry, there's at the time, like 2017, 2018, uh, there's a lot of like hardcore uh, scenes were happening and and even like the the sort of like uh, interest in in like um, causing like women to like I'm just gonna say it like pink sock was like a fucking porn for search term oh, yeah. in those years. Yeah, that was like that seems like very clearly a kind of like mindset towards female bodies that is like openly. Um, hostile you know like that's an that's like an assault on a woman's bodily at- integrity as far as I'm concerned so I I yeah I think it's it like to me it's the thing that matters is like is something happening to a woman that she doesn't want I I personally am not afraid of anal I don't have ever had anal sex I like barely put anything in my butt just to kind of experiment to make sure I didn't like it but like, I have a friend who fucking loves it she likes it more than vaginal sex she like when she like learned to masturbate as a teen it was just shoving her fists up her butt like, and I'm like, okay, this is totally foreign to me. This sounds horrible, but she genuinely <laughs> likes it. And so I'm like, you know what? Like, it's like, to her, is it degradation? Like, I don't think, like, it, it, the degradation <laughs> is entirely dependent on whether or not, like, the woman's attitude towards it. Like, is she experiencing it as degra- degradation? Because to her, like, it is, like, the like the best expression of love. It's like she wants a man to really feel connected to her. For it, her, it's the butt. I'm like, okay. I don't get it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Okay, like, I have questions. <laughs> like immediately, my top question is like, was she somehow like conditioned to accept that, or was that is that the product of some sort of like pathology, right? Uh... <laughs> like, I mean, the, like, so I'm mean, to some extent, I'm like, does it matter? Like, like, if yes, it happen- matters. <laughs> yes, it matters because then you're like you're re-entrenching like an, an orientation to the self that's that's sort of like. Uh, degenerating or de- degrading like you're not you're not trying to go through this life understanding yourself better and making yourself more whole and and healthy right. and capable you're sort of like like you know fuck that bitch like <laughs> about yourself that's that's kind yeah, of like, not- like at some point this attitude starts to get like a little bit close to like the old kind of shame like this is like the kind of talk that i would hear growing up like oh you want to like have premarital sex like that's degrading to you do you really respect yourself like this is like you must somehow be harming yourself and at some point you just have to be like like or, or like they say premarital sex is like the kind of the result of a pathology like you must be deviant in some way or broken to like this and like at some point i just you just have to trust women like like doubting a woman's experience like and I, I think just people's brains can be really varied. And, and like, if, if she seemed to be, like, off about it somehow, but as far as I can tell, knowing her, she just genuinely likes it. And, I, like, doubting it kind of feels a little weird to me. Just at some no, point, like, I mean, doubting it. At which I'm like, am I just blaming her now? Oh, I see. Yeah. No, I mean, to me, I'm I, I'm real with my friends. So if a friend comes to me with some sort of like delusion, I'm going to question her. I'm going to be like, oh, are you sure that's not the product of of like some fucked up thinking? Uh, because that's not doing her a favor. Like, you know, just going along with her delusion isn't really doing her a favor. The other aspect of that is I've had I've had friends go through like terrible addictions. And so the thing that feels good to my friend might be like uh 
just like slamming heroin all day every day that feels really fucking good to her and she loves it and she is telling me that that's just like how she was born she's like she found that drug and it was her drug and that's all she wants to do with the rest of her life is found, find ways to access that drug and it but it is incredibly destructive so am I going to like trust her to just like reframe that experience as a healthy one no <laughs> like I'm gonna fight for her life because I love her right. yeah but but how do you differentiate then? Like if you have like Christian conservatives telling me that like premarital sex is degenerate and actually going to hurt me, like they have a conception of harm and like they, they, I could hypothetically imagine them saying the exact same thing that you are saying. So how do we differentiate them from you? Like how do I not That's use okay. my, I'm... The, the way that I'm dismissing them, the rule of reason, I could use the same to you. So what, what's the difference? Uh, I'm not I'm not sure that I'm interested to be that differentiated. I think people are allowed to have like we talked about boundaries earlier, right? And you're telling me that you know you have to you have to have like boundaries. You can't just accept someone completely, et cetera, et cetera. Similarly, I think that shame plays an important role in society and some some things are worthy of being shamed. And society does get to set its rules about what is shameful behavior. So if you're gonna function inside of a community, Right. Like you can you can decide to externalize yourself from that community if you're not willing to behave according to their mores. Um, similarly, for, for me, uh, it's, it's OK. Like I, my message isn't for everyone. And, and my my friendship circle is pretty tight. Like I, I love the friends that I have with like everything in my being. And that is like a drive towards like I said, more capable, more present, more more healthy, more longevity. Th those are the drives and those are the values that me and my friends share. So if, if like someone is going to self-exclude on the basis that that I find some things worthy of shaming, that's also okay, you know? I mean, yeah, I mean, from my perspective, it just kind of sounds like a conservative Christian could be telling me that. That's okay. <laughs> I'm not, I don't find that I'm not like, I don't think that I'm interested to like shit on conservative Christians. Like they all, yes, they, they have their value system. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, okay, this is fair. I, I just, uh, yeah, I just, yeah, I guess my values are very different from conservative Christians. <laughs> okay. In what way? What are, what are you, what would you consider to be your core values? Uh, like, uh, well, maybe, I mean, it depends on how you frame it, but there's something core about it, which is like, I am the author of myself. Like there's a way where in the Christians, they've kept like trying in various ways. I, I wasn't their explicit intent, but it was sort of like the way that it was structured to like remove my, the weight amount that I knew myself and my agency over my body and put it in like a God or culture in some way. Like, oh, if you think that you feel this way, you're wrong. There's a lot of emotional suppression, like, uh, it, it, it was just, it was just like, not you, the outside, not you, God, not you, Christian culture. Um, so if I had to say like a value that I most differentiate is sort of like self-agency, like ultimately uh -huh. I am the author over myself. Yeah. Yeah. I, to I, I totally agree. Me too. <laughs> Me too. And, uh, and so that's like, I mean, I try not to tell people what to do, but again, th those are some of my boundaries. Like I, uh, for, for me, it's been become very clear that you are kind of like the average of like the 10 people closest to you in terms of like, um, like immune system, like psychological regulation, uh, achievement, attainment, all of that stuff. So like, yeah, I cultivate a very, like I said, like, um, a kind of like wolf pack of like really fucking fierce females. <laughs> and so like we, one of the ways that we help each other is, is to point out some self-defeating um, sort of thought patterns or practices or ways that they're compromising with the culture that I think is openly hostile to them that might be, that might have long-term consequences that are negative. Right. And, and the involvement of shame, I'm not about it just because I don't think it's a good motivator. <laughs> That's a cats always do that. Hey, eh? they're like, oh, let me just get in front of whatever you're doing. <laughs> that's that's that would be like my like picking on it is that shame is just not a good motivator. Like it's not you know exogenous behavior change isn't isn't really possible, especially not by shaming somebody. So so that's that's where I would like pick apart the kind of like shame systems of some of those conservative Christian um, yeah. communities. But it it seems like 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 the steel man of behavior changing is like. <clears throat> like what do you, what do you want like say for example somebody's addicted to drugs and they're like i really like doing drugs and you're like i don't like i th i think like the the perspective from which you can critique them is like i don't think the thing that you actually want 
which you should probably check in with them, is actually aligned with doing drugs. Like maybe you, you really value having like a body that doesn't fall apart. And if you really value this, like maybe I'm just like trying to point out like the inconsistency in the two things, the two values you have that seem to be colliding, like really concrete things. Like you're going to have to go to the hospital and pay money versus, <laughs> right? Like these are very clear. Um, and so it's like less working from like a cultural norm and working from their norm. Because if I talk to somebody who's a drug addict and they're like, you know what? I am ready to die. I would like to, to I just genuinely from the bottom of my heart, like really want, don't want to live past 30. Um, then I could be like, I don't know what basis I have for critiquing your drug use, bro. I'm, I'm simplifying a little bit. Um, but maybe that's a different, like maybe you're, the crux here is that you're like, uh, you think that there's like norms that are good for them regardless of their own value set. Yeah, I'm not a believer. I'm not, I'm not about like, there's a kind of American like super individualism that is, uh, is not real for me. Like, it's just like something that I don't, um, I don't, I like, I don't see it. I think it's like a construct. I don't think it's possible for each of us to be, uh, to exercise like perfect agency at all times. Like we are interdependent systems. Like we are, that's, you know, yeah. yeah that's there's, a little orthogonal to my point though. Um, no, but we're talking about agency and agency is compromised by, by all sorts of things, including addiction. Like agency is, you don't have total agency because you don't, you don't have a billion dollars, for example, right? You can't always have exactly what you want. And so agency is, is constantly modulated by various external factors. And then, yes, I also do think that it's, uh, it's very important to, to operate from, from like an, an ethical standpoint. And so this this whole idea that everyone can do whatever they want is is false and and like ultimately antisocial and and destructive of the self and yeah. of others so it's not something that it's it's a standard like you know that that whole concept of like the thing that you walk by is the thing that you accept whether that's like you know a, a child begging on the street or or like a, a young indigenous woman being prostituted on the corner if you just walk past it that means that you're okay with it that you accept it right uh uh, but this feels, I feel like 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 maybe I miss. Uh, do you want to do you want oh. to reframe your question? <laughs> I guess I wasn't sure. Well, I mean, there's a thing where it's like the thing that I said, which is like, do you is value like uh, sort of values that are socially ascribed? But there's a different thing where it's like, uh, let's say somebody sh does heroin and then this makes them like ninety percent likely to go rob someone. Then like you're doing heroin is now my business. Because uh -huh. like, like, so there's a, there, there's like two separate things. There's like, what impact are you, is your behavior actually having on other people? Like maybe you have a kid and you don't take care of the kid. Now somebody else has to take care of the fucking kid. Like, right. That's when it becomes like, it's like, it's like a problem, but this is like a different concept from the original thing that I was asking about. Okay. So restate. Um, I think the original thing I was asking about was like, uh, so like the drug one's like a little bit bad because it, we, we blend into, but let's say somebody really likes, um, like eating dirt, uh, and then you're like, bro, <laughs> uh, I think this like might cause you some health problems. And they're like, no, I have deeply evaluated eating dirt and health problems. And like the benefit I get out of eating dirt is clearly better than the health problems. I'm willing to in full consciousness make the sacrifice. And my value system would be like, I can't critique that. If they're fully aware of all of the, the things, I can't. And, and I'm like, maybe your value system would be like, there's some other norm which we're, by which we're measuring them by where we can still critique that, even if they're like very in line with their values. Uh, it's not, it's not about it, in this case, in this example, it wouldn't be about the norm because it's not hurting anyone else. Are they hurting themselves? Maybe, but maybe not. Like, um, th like there's all kinds of reasons I could see that somebody would be craving dirt. So like immediately what would occur to me is like, is this the, the, the nascent, like the, the initiation, the, like the beginning of some like, uh, you know, psychological issue because that's pika, right? Like eating things that aren't food like that, that is like, there's an underlying problem. So that would be, I, I would want to know more, right? I wouldn't just immediately be like, oh, this is okay for the community and there's no norm that it crosses. So like, I'm just going to leave you like in the corner of my yard to eat dirt. <laughs> like probably not. Like also how much of, how much of your life is being now consumed by this new dirt eating obsession. <laughs> and like, you know, I just would want to know more because if I, if I care about that person, I want to know, you know, yeah, that's, that's it. And also like, I do have an underlying belief that that is spiritual, that we are each, um, an expression of life's longing for itself so that we do have a responsibility to that life that is expressing itself through us to to do the, the best that we can with it and at it and and for each other so like yeah I do have a kind of 
all like adjacent to religion kind of like orientation towards the sacredness of life. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I have a sense that like digging into this would take quite a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's fair enough. I guess it, it might, but <laughs> is it a conversation that you're trying to have? I was just curious. <clears throat> I just think like the way that you answer things is like uh, hard for me to parse a little bit. Like I think we probably have different conversational norms. Um, like, at, like, and so I have to like figure out how to. I don't know. I was like, okay. I just like had the realization that like I'm gonna have to like work through like the the our different languages in some way. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, English like, is my like, third like, language. Yeah, broad kind of things. Like, like I'm trying. I think I tend to go for concrete examples, like eating dirt. And then often your responses to my questions have been sort of like. So like, yeah. okay, we have different, different like ways of thinking about this. <laughs> right, right, right. Yes, yeah, true, true, true. I'm trying to like, I, you know, my basis is is like larger philosophical theories and like, you know, things like integral theory and systems theory and stuff. Like, so I'm, I am looking for the bigger thing. Like the smaller phenomenon is not interesting to me in itself. You're right about that. I'm looking for it as, as like, how is an expression of something larger, of like a larger dynamic or cultural shift or like even vibe? Like, I don't, I don't care what we call it. Like, I want to know where it is in the flow, like, and what's, what's happening with it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think the way I think is very much like, <laughs> let's design a diagnostic test run the hypothesis <laughs> yeah diagnostic yeah, yeah, yeah. no Mo modify and reiterate like that's very much the way i think about things so yeah very different languages that is totally fair that is totally fair we're at 90 minutes so i like you know i think we've had i think we've had a great discussion it's taken us all over the place and i've abandoned my some of my questions but i i really enjoyed talking to you and i yeah. i hope that uh yeah i hope that our audience will get something out of this and Mm, yeah, I I would actually love to re-engage on some of this this with you in the future. You know, if we can, if you're yeah. interested, maybe you're more interested in like discrete and specific phenomenon and measuring them. But like, I'm interested in what is your bigger philosophy? You know? Yeah, I I enjoy uh, talking to someone who like both disagrees and like is reasonable. So like occasionally people <laughs> disagree and are like angry or something. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's just nice to have like the the good combo. I swear, I promise I'm not angry. I'm genuinely interested in, yeah, in I think, what you're saying. I, yeah. I want to know. Like, I want to know more. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, thank All you right. so much. Thank you. Thank you. That was lovely. Bye. Goodbye for now. And uh, to our audience, we have more shows coming up. I have another interview tomorrow uh, with Chris Ryan, who wrote uh, Sex at Dawn. So this will be an interesting sort of like continuation of our conversation right now and that is all <laughs> i'm gonna ask our like production team to go ahead and shut this down <laughs>